My name is Peter Murphy from the Politics in the Pub Committee and um, thanks for your patience. Now our speakers are all here and ready to go. Um, the uh, first thing I want to do is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respect to their elders past and present. Um, we've got a great topic tonight. Um, we all know what's uh, going on in the uh, great controversies in Sydney about planning, about the West Connects, the North Connects, the Metro, lots of uh, uh, big schemes put up by the Baird government and a lot of controversy as the community deals with it. So the topic is how the Baird government's new planning targets are undermining good governance. And we've got two great speakers tonight in uh, Jeanette Brockman and David Shoebridge. Jeanette is the co-convener for Better Planning De Network, founded in 2012 in response to the then proposed planning reforms. The network today has hundreds of members and affiliates. It's really big. Jeanette comes from a long career in the corporate sector and is now a passionate activist for better urban planning and achieving better environmental outcomes. She's passionate about robust conversation and dialogue as a catalyst to achieving positive change, where the communities have trust again in the planning system and its outcomes inspire us rather than fail the public interest. So uh, we're going to have a passionate speaker tonight. Uh, David Shoebridge, you would know well here at Politics in the Pub. He's a Greens member of the Legislative Council since 2010. Before entering Parliament, David worked as a lawyer for 13 years, the majority of this time as a barrister representing workers, unions and ordinary citizens. David is the Greens New South Wales spokesperson for Justice and Police, Forestry, Industrial Relations, Planning and Heritage, Firearms and Local Government. So we're going to have a whiz-bang presentation. So uh, David will be the first speaker. Please welcome him. Uh, turn off your mobile phones now. Here we go, David. Uh, thanks for the introduction. But I'd love to talk about gun control, um, but it's not the uh, subject for tonight. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge we're meeting on the land of the Gadigal people, uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present, um, and confirm that as, a, as an MP in the oldest parliament on the continent, the institution that was most directly responsible, apart from the Imperial Parliament, for the dispossession of Aboriginal people, that we have an obligation to have a treaty with our First Peoples and to get a treaty sooner rather than later, um, which includes a return of sovereignty. Um, uh, planning. Planning in New South Wales. Um, the New South Wales Parliament is a disappointing institution. Uh, it doesn't get any better when you look at it close up. Um, and when it comes to planning law, um, the New South Wales Parliament did one good thing. It did one really good thing. Oh, yeah, I will, I'll tell you. Um, but you have to cast your mind back to 1979 um, when it passed the Environmental Plan Assessment Act. And it said um, that uh, our city is being uh, converted around us, being developed, um, priced, remodelled, sold, um, destroyed, remade around us, and we have no say in that. And it's time that ended. And so in 1979, we had truly world-leading laws put through the New South Wales Parliament that said, before planning instruments are made at a local, regional and state level, there's an obligation, and this was the first time ever, there's an obligation to consult with the residents and the people who'll be affected. And they need to go out on exhibition and you need, to un you need to get people's submissions on it and then you need to listen to them and the planning instruments need to be informed by the people whose lives will potentially be fundamentally altered by them. And they said for developments, when there's going to be a development in an area, well when the development's going to have an impact on adjoining residents, to the extent of that impact that the adjoining residents have a right to be heard, have their views taken into account because they have legitimate views that about their residential amenity, about the shape and nature of their neighbourhood. It was a fundamentally democratic planning reform. And, and it came with some of the very first recognition of uh, ecologically sustainable development. And this concept that when you're looking at planning, it shouldn't just be about the interests of the landowner mediated through a planning authority. 
that in fact when you're talking about planning, all planning laws put constraints and opportunities on land. And landowners, when they get the benefit of a rezoning or a development approval, as a result of that communal decision, that community decision to grant them a development approval or increase their rezoning, they get very large potential private returns. And, and part of the quid pro quo of that should be that the society that's giving the returns should have a genuine say in the development, the size, the impact, the nature of, of, of what's proposed. Of course it should. Now it was revolutionary in 1979 because we'd been used to the likes of Asken, you know, and, um, and, and you know, we lost our laneways. Our city was just demolished in the late 60s um, and, and early 70s. It was literally demolished and remade around, around us at the time. And it was this breath of fresh air. Now, it wasn't perfect. I don't think it had enough environmental um, safeguards in it. Um, I think it potentially allowed bad councils to act particularly badly. Um, there weren't a lot of state checks and balances in it. There were um, few, if any, incentives to reduce the carbon footprint of our development or to encourage development that allowed for um, critical mass for public transport and the like, but it was a pretty fundamentally positive democratic reform in 1979. And of course, the story of the next 30 odd years was those, the development industry that was constrained by the 1979 Act, the development industry for the, for the first time ever had to deal with pesky citizens and locals and neighbours and you know, annoying elected councillors who thought that there actually was some politics in planning. Um, well, they've turned on that act and they have attacked it mercilessly and they have paid for the politicians to get into parliament to destroy it. And so now we have, you know, an evisceration of the 1979 act with an unholy mess of get out of jail free cards for developers. And, and, and bit by bit, the central tenet of democratic engagement in planning has been removed from the Planning Act. Um, we now have the vast majority of new dwellings, new individual dwellings approved under things called exempt and complying codes where there's no right to be heard, none. No right even really to be notified apart from about construction's about to happen next door. And that's why if you go to parts of Sydney now, you'll see these cookie cutter box like structures that fill the entire block. You can have a run of a particular style of say post-war housing or interwar housing and then all of a sudden you get this square two story block that is like 1.2 metres from each side, square, square sided, no eaves and just this massive block filling development. It's ugly, it's got no architectural merit, it's got a huge carbon footprint, um, it's probably um, got a lower resale value than something that is more sensitively designed, but it gets approved under exempt and complying codes in a cookie cutter model. If it fits in a certain envelope, well then it just gets approved by a private certifier paid for by the developer and bugger the neighbours. You have no right, no right at all to be heard. Um, it's why we have something called the Planning Assessment Commission which when it comes to the really big projects, you know, like a particularly offensive casino on 22 hectares of public land in Barangaroo. Um, the Planning Assessment Commission is populated by a bunch of pro-developer, well, they're not necessarily pro-developer, but they're industry players, planners and architects and uh, safe former bureaucrats um, who populate the Planning Assessment Commission and have Last time we checked, a 97% agreement with whatever the New South Wales Planning Department says. That's convenient, isn't it? But no democratic control at all on that. Um, and now we have this new monolith that's taken charge of our city, headed by Lucy Turnbull. Put your hand up if you voted for Lucy Turnbull to remodel your city. Um, called the Greater Sydney Commission. And the Greater Sydney Commission has six district commissioners under Lucy. 
And those six district commissioners are individually responsible for developing district plans for the entire city of Sydney. Who are they consulting with while they're doing it? Primarily administrators appointed by, uh, uh, by the Baird government to run what used to be democratic councils. No democratic input at all. No right to be heard on a district plan. There is a requirement for them to be exhibited at some point by the district commissioners. Um, but there's no statutory obligation on anyone, a district commissioner or the head of the Greater Sydney Commission, to even talk to anybody. And we saw recently just how out of touch the Greater Sydney Commission is when the head of the Greater Sydney Commission, Lucy Turnbull, when she was asked about what she thought about the impact of West Connex and the destruction of those beautiful heritage properties, she said, what? Destruction of heritage properties? I haven't, I haven't heard there are any destruction of heritage, heritage properties. I don't know what you're talking about. This is the woman in charge of the future of the city of Sydney. And she has no idea about the core issues that are faced by the residents of a city she will remodel. And the extent of change in our city is accelerating. Our city is, again, just like it was in the 60s and 70s, being remade around us and we have no say at all in it. I saw a, um, I saw a, the documentary called Rampant um, just last week. And Rampant is a fascinating documentary. It tells the story of one of those few occasions when politics worked. And it was in the mid-1980s, early to mid-1980s, and the HIV virus um, well, what we now know is the HIV virus found itself in Sydney, particularly, you know, around Oxford Street in the centre of the city. And we actually had a government and an opposition at a federal level come together and do an extraordinary response, you know, an internationally best practice response. But it was a story of, as I said, of politics works, but there was this moment in that documentary where they were panning this screen, this, this, this camera panned Sydney, a view of Sydney, from Centrepoint Tower, from about 1986. And it started um, from around about um, panning down to the north end of the city. And then it panned out across the eastern suburbs and across all the way around through Central and through the inner west. And you saw this extraordinary pan of the city. And I didn't recognise it. I don't think anyone would recognise it. There were green trees and red roofs. Green trees and red roofs was the predominant built form in that entire section. Whereas now, if you did it, you would see this complete remodeling of apartment towers and power after tower of apartment towers and remodeling now for the West Connects and a fundamentally different city. We're back where we were in the 60s and the 70s, where our city is being remodeled around us. Projects like West Connects, grossly objected to by pretty much every citizen who put a submission in and we were ignored, approved by the Planning and Assessment Commission. The, how are they getting it done? How is it happening? Well, we actually have a very clever state government, well, to some extent. Um, um, they had some iconic reform that they wanted to have. Uh, one big bill that they presented for a reform, planning reform agenda, which you know, which we actually produced the Better Planning Network because it was a grossly undemocratic proposal to completely remove democracy from most of the Planning Act. Um, they developed this draft bill um, and it generated community interest in planning. People had a look at what their agenda was and they could see quite plainly that the agenda was for once and for all to actually get rid of our democratic input in planning. And this big bill suddenly generated a big community response and a very large engagement. And the community overwhelmingly said, we reject that view of planning. We reject the concept that you will cut us out of decisions about our neighbourhoods and our cities. We reject a top-down model where you get a bunch of experts to set the basic rules and then everyone below it at a regional and a council level has to remake their planning instruments to deal with what this team of experts that we've never elected have put in place. And the bill was ultimately defeated or amended so as the government wouldn't support it by a narrow majority in the New South Wales Upper House. 
So what did the government do? Well, it didn't change its agenda. It still wants to take us out entirely of planning. It just changed its strategy. So what is the government's current planning agenda? Is it about coming up with some basic principles for planning, in, in, particularly in Sydney, that talks about having a human scale, livable, walkable city? Is it a government that is saying, well, let's have a look at what the best parts of our city are, the ones that people want to live in, the ones that have density that produces um, quality, regular public transport, that produces parks and open space and human scale development um, that people want to live in? And I'd nominate parts of our city, such as Paddington and Newtown, um, even parts of King's Cross and Bondi, areas of the city we, which were basically largely built at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, where we were relatively energy poor, where we were reliant upon public transport, where we had a concept of building developments but ensuring that there was public gardens and space available for the residents. You know, the government is not looking at that as a model at all. In fact, actively rejecting that as a model. They've looked around Sydney and their model is Breakfast Point, which is row upon row of tower blocks, sort of Cobusius style development with some sort of tokenistic park and surrounded by a snarl of traffic. Or their alternative to that, if you don't want that, they say, we're going to give you endless sprawl in southwest Sydney and northwest Sydney, just endless unsustainable sprawl. They, they put this dichotomy, this completely false dichotomy for planning. You can either have row upon row of towers and endless towers with sufficient density that we may at some point put a privatised metro station to, or you can have endless urban sprawl, as though this is the dichotomy facing Sydney, but it is not. We know that the best, the, best, the, best, the best lessons of planning say we can, develop, we can deliver density. And somewhere like Newtown is the 18th most densely populated suburb anywhere in the country. It produces extraordinary... And, and King's Cross, Elizabeth Bay, King's Cross is the 10th most densely populated suburb anywhere in the country. Same goes for Bondi. We can deliver density. Density sufficient to deliver quality public transport quality public parks at a human scale in a city we want to live in without resorting to Breakfast Point. But that is not the government's agenda. They have now decided that they won't put a big act through. They won't just do a one-off reform. They're going to pull apart the Planning Act, the remnants of it, through a series of piecemeal reforms. We've got the Greater Sydney Commission, undemocratic centralised takeover. We've had the ex expansion of exempt and compliant development literally cutting us all out of any say about most residential development, single dwelling residential development. They have now got a list of about 16 priority precincts all around the city. Banks here, Arncliffe, South West Sydney, North West Sydney, basically um, anywhere that they're thinking of doing any marginal change to public transport, they carve out whole square kilometres of the city and they take the planning controls away from the local council, they give it to some bureaucrats in planning and they massively upscale the development proposals. And you have no say in it. Well, you can write a submission, but the plan's already done. They are cutting down, simplifying, streamlining is the word, removing green tape from core state environmental planning policies that have been there, protecting things like wetlands and koalas and energy, energy consumption and the like, and ripping the guts out of those statewide planning things. And later this year, we're going to get probably two or three individual planning bills that will degrade ecologically sustainable development principles in the Act. That will entrench private certifiers. Um, they have learnt the lesson that if you want to really do a job on a city, if you want to do a job on planning, well, the best way to do it is not in one big go, because then all people will work out what you're after. Do you know what you do? You slice it and you dice it and you kill democratic, sustainable planning through the death of a thousand cuts. And that's the government's agenda. It's clever. It doesn't generate critical mass in opposition and they get what they want. So our task, I think, our task is to reimagine our city, to learn 
and, and not not in some sort of complete whiteboard thing as though we can come up with some you know um, uh, nirvana that's unrelated to our history we need to look at the parts of our city that people value and love and they want to live in that are built on a human scale that are sustainable that are energy uh, that are that are respectful in terms of their energy use that have sufficient density to produce, um, to, to ensure we have public transport and community facilities. We need to learn the lessons of the past. We need to be saying, what, is, what kind of city do we want to live in? Well, we know what city we want to live in. Ones that respect human scale, have green streets, sufficient density for public transport, but are not these cookie cutter towers of Breakfast Point. It's parts of our city, like Newtown, like parts of Elizabeth Bay, like Paddington. It's respectful development. We need to reimagine what it is we want. Um, and we need to ensure that we unmask the real agenda from the government. They know that they can't get it in one big hit without generating community response. Well, we need to actually reclaim our city. We need to reclaim our rights on planning. And we better do it pretty quickly before they knock the rest of it over. Thank you. Thank you very much, David.